I wish I could see you. I uh, miss you already. It feels like it's been a few months since we've been able to gather together and see everybody's face, and I miss it a ton. I've talked to a lot of you on the phone, but uh, it's just not quite the same as being in person, so I'm definitely uh, looking forward to and excited about whenever we finally do get to um, see each other again and uh, spend some time in the in person in the same room. Uh, here's what we're gonna do in the next few minutes. I am about to uh, give some just uh, updated announcements uh, and uh, those we're gonna start the recording so that those announcements and then the sermon will be posted at 1045. Uh, please uh, help us share where this is, as I've said many, many times, a fantastic opportunity for us to leverage this season uh, of life and quarantine for the gospel. So uh, help share on Facebook and uh, social media. Uh, when we're posting things and sermon, especially so that people can hear about Jesus when hopefully they've got a little bit of extra time on their hands. All right. Well, for this morning, got uh, five announcements for you. So uh, first off, thanks for being here for Redeemer Online Week 2. Uh, first announcement, since we have shifted everything really quickly, we're trying to adapt uh, as quickly as we can. We're shifting things online, and that's going to affect a lot of the things that we had planned online. So the first announcement is the Next Steps class, which normally we get to do in person. We are going to continue to have that, but it's going to be through a video Zoom call, and that will be today at 1 o'clock. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, Redeemer Midland and find the link for that Zoom call. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about Redeemer and what it looks like to be part of Redeemer and consequently what it looks like to be part of Redeemer Online, uh, let me encourage you to sign in at one o'clock and I'll be there doing a live Zoom call walking you through some next steps at Redeemer. Uh, number two, this is a super fun thing that we are going to be trying next Sunday is uh, Online baptisms. Uh, this is going to be fun. Really excited about this. We've got some people that have been waiting uh, to be baptized for quite a while, and we had planned on this date already, so we're going to go ahead and move forward with this and let them baptize uh, in their own homes, and we will do that through live video uh, as well during the service next Sunday. So if you're interested in getting some information about baptism or being baptized on that day, please uh, put that in the chat uh, or send a message to us in the next few moments so we can get you ready to go. Number three, Redeemer Equip. Uh, Pastor James, we were so excited. A few weeks ago, he started our first classes for Redeemer Equip, and he was walking us through some spiritual disciplines. And uh, I think it was great timing that we were able to roll that out right before the quarantine happened. Um, so we're going to keep moving forward with some Redeemer Equip classes that hopefully meet you right where you're at in the situation that you are in uh, right now and equip you for work of ministry. Uh, so we have a class coming up tomorrow. Monday night at 8.30. It will be a Zoom call uh, about discipleship at home. Pastor James is going to walk through and give us some uh, recommended reading tools, tips, and scripture about uh, engaging in discipleship in our houses, and uh, super excited about that. Again, you can go to the Facebook page for that link. Um, number four, I want to point you towards a new page on our website, RedeemerMidland.org slash online church. Lots of helpful information we are going to be continually posting in the next few days. Um, if you want some playlists and recommended songs to worship, it's on there. If you're looking for a material to use to disciple your kids at home, if you're looking for links to events and classes coming up, it's all there. So go to RedeemerMidland.org slash online church and hopefully find all that information super helpful and last but not least number five uh, and this is really to everybody that calls redeemer home um, but to any of you that might be listening uh, that uh, love jesus and want the mission of christ to go forward in midland i want to encourage you to give uh, that's going to continue to help us as a church and a staff as we shift things online and as we adapt to minister in the name of jesus so uh, please give if uh, you have the opportunity and ability to do that you can do that online, you can do that through the app, or you can mail a check to the P.O. box here in town. Well, that's the, uh, the announcements that we have uh, for this morning. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions or need anything, please reach out and let us know. 
Well, uh, welcome to, again, week two of Redeemer Church Online. Uh, this is not ideal. Ideally, we would love to gather in person and worship God together, lifting up our voices and hearing God's word and responding in prayer and, and communion. And uh, in some seasons, it's not possible. So while this is not ideal, we are adapting and making the best of it. Uh, I'm getting some projects at my house done that have been on the to-do list for a long time. Uh, and every night we're telling our kids that, hey, if you uh, if y'all get along with each other and uh, if you'll clean your room, then tomorrow we won't have to go to school. Uh, just kidding, kind of. Um, but uh, I hope that you are really uh, adapting and uh, enjoying and making the best of the situation. Um, so for those of you who are part of Redeemer, uh, we truly do miss you and welcome you to Redeemer Online. And for maybe those of you who are not part of Redeemer, or maybe you're interested in showing up, or maybe this is your first time to tune into something, really honored and excited that you're here with us. So welcome to Redeemer Online. Um, this morning, uh, I, I'm really going to uh, just preach one simple, short verse. Uh, it's in Hebrews, so if you have a Bible, let me invite you to turn to Hebrews 12, and if you do not, it will be on the screen here for you. Uh, and even though it's a short verse, it's only you know one sentence, it's pretty powerful. Uh, it's like the words that I mentioned quite a few years ago. I was standing on a stage, and I said the two words, I do. Uh, they were very short and simple words, yet they really do pack a lifetime of meaning. Uh, the verse that I want to look at in Hebrews chapter 12, although it's short, it has an incredible amount uh, of timeless meaning for us, uh, and especially in the situation that we find ourselves in this week. So that's what I'm preaching today, and the next week we're going to jump back into our series on the book of Galatians. Uh, I grew up as many of you know, in the Panhandle, just outside of Amarillo. And we spend a lot of time fishing in a lake called Lake Meredith up in the Panhandle. And Lake Meredith is one of the most dangerous lakes in the, the state, for sure, maybe the U.S., and partly because of the way it's configured and just the placement of it on the high plains. Uh, out of nowhere, horrible storms can just come out uh, out of the blue. It can be calm and you can be uh, enjoying a nice sunny day. And then in a few moments, 30, 40, 50 mile an hour winds with crazy storms that uh, can wreak havoc on the lake. And my dad and I used to load up. We had a deep V-hole bass tracker boat. We would load that up and go up to Lake Meredith and fish for walleye, uh, especially in the winter. We would take that boat and try to get as close as we could to the shore and find a little ledge where it dropped off. And that's where we would uh, put the anchor down and fish for walleye. And uh, my job was I was the anchor boy, as my dad lovingly phrased it, which means I sat up on the bow of the boat where all the water splashed up on you and you went up and down holding the anchor. And dad would be in the back driving back and forth, trying to figure out where this ledge just dropped off, where we think the walleye are going to be and when he finally would get to the place where we wanted to fish he would just yell anchor boy and I would make sure this is very important I'd make sure the anchor is tied to the boat and not wrapped around my arm or leg or something and then toss the anchor into the water and then we would begin to drift uh, and then really the most important part of my job was after the anchor caught something I would grab the rope and gank on it and pull on it with all my might to test the anchor to see if it was actually going to hold. Um, because the last thing that you want is to have calm waters, toss the anchor and think that it's fine, get all your gear out, all your poles out, start fishing, and then out of nowhere a storm hits and the anchor actually wasn't that secure and you're only a few yards from the from the shore and then it really quickly drags you and smashes you into the rocks. So it's really important that you test the anchor. And if the anchor would be down and I would give it a tug and it would give at all, then my dad would say, let's move, let's move the anchor. And he would uh, take us back and we would do it all over again. Uh, it's really important, um, you know, when you're fishing in situations like that, uh, that you have to be sturdy enough to endure a storm. And as you know, I think we all know and I think would all agree, even if we don't agree with the reactions and what's going on, we would all agree that this uh, there, a storm has just hit us uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, there's some things that none of us saw coming. Uh, none of us saw the economic downturn and recession that would r really hit the United States and especially the Permian Basin overnight. Uh, everything was fine and calm until uh, that hit out of the blue. Uh, a lot of people ha have lost jobs and are worried about their jobs moving forward. Uh, retirement accounts, I haven't even looked at mine. Um, 
th that's a storm that we were not expecting to hit. Uh, and then just the health and the future health of maybe uh, people in our family or people in our city, that's a storm that we were not expecting. And just debating about wiping with uh, coffee filters and nobody expected that they would be sitting in that situation in life. But uh, this storm kind of hit out of the blue. Uh, and uh, it's really going to test uh, where your hope is. Uh, I think seasons like this test where your true identity is and where your anchor in life is. And so my guess is, for those of you watching uh, and part of this with us this morning, is you're probably in one of two places. Either number one, you just need to be reminded of where your anchor is, that your anchor is in Christ, your hope is in Christ, your identity is in Christ, and you need to be reminded that this is a season that Jesus will take care of you and this storm too shall pass. Um, that's probably going to be some of you. And my job as a, as a pastor and a preacher, and really the job of, of preachers all since the Old Testament, a huge portion of our job has not been to tell you anything new, uh, but to remind you of something you already know. Uh, that's a huge portion of the life and ministry of prophets and preachers. So maybe you need reminded of this, um, but I'm, I'm certain that there's people of you, some of you tuning in with us today that don't need to be reminded of this, but need to be invited to this. Uh, maybe your world has been completely turned upside down. Uh, your kingdom has been shaken. Uh, your hope has been shaken, and maybe your soul is uh, just a little more anxious than you ever thought possible in this season. Uh, I want to point you towards Hebrews 12 and just let you be invited to the hope of the gospel. Um, because in a situation like this, uh, when these storms hit out of the blue, uh, it might be an opportunity for you to move your anchor, uh, to realize that maybe our, your anchor wasn't as sturdy as you thought it was if it was placed in the economy, uh, if it was placed in your health. And now you realize that one way or another, our health will not always be there. Uh, your job, understand that maybe now your job is not guaranteed and maybe the U.S. economy is not unshakable. Uh, so while, you know, we were fishing in Lake Meredith, the anchor could hold on some calm storms or some calm waters. But when the storm hits, it was tested. And so for many of you, I think this is a time where you really need to take some deep, honest inventory of your heart and your hope and your soul and find out if there's a, an opportunity here for you to move your anchor. Uh, so the setting of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews uh, is a book of the Bible, it's in the New Testament, and uh, was written to a group of Hebrews, or Jewish people, Christians, uh, that followed Jesus in the first century. And really the main point of this uh, book of Hebrews is to encourage Christians in a time of trial. Uh, these Christians were facing a lot of storms in life, uh, a lot of trials were coming their way, and so this book of Hebrews was written right into the situation where they were living, uh, right into the fear, right into the chaos, right into the anxiety, and it was a uh, purpose to remind them that there's an anchor that's strong enough to see them through the storms that they were facing. Uh, for some of them, it was persecution. If you read through the book of Hebrews, you find out that there was a lot of persecution that they were facing, that they had faced, and that was probably coming up for them in the future. They didn't have any government protection. They were just out alone with their persecutors. Uh, there was famine in some places, uh, which famine in the first century is different than all the groceries being gone at HEB today. Uh, famine for them, there were no grocery stores. There were no canned goods. There was no fallback plan. There was no plan B. Uh, famine for Christians in the first century would have been an absolutely terrifying thing to know where your food for you and your family is going to come in the next few days. Uh, there were sickness and plagues and they had no insurance, no hospitals, no vaccinations, really not much medicine at all. And so when things uh, like plagues would come up, no doubt they might be terrified. And uh, so this book was written to them to remind them of an anchor. Uh, there were political upheavals and things that they experienced that we haven't experienced. There was no voting. There was no involvement of the people. There was no easy transfer of power uh, like we have for the most part in the West. And so political upheavals would really just shake the entire kingdom that they lived in. Uh, poverty, there were lots of people that worked hard, yet they had very little. And so this was like the situation of the first century Christians, and the book of Hebrews is written right in the middle of that. And uh, in short, it was the, their kingdom was being shaken all of the, around them. And so the writer of Hebrews does not focus on the storm. He doesn't write the book of Hebrews and then focus most of his time and energy on the issues at hand. What he does do 
is he writes the book of Hebrews and he focuses on the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. In the midst of the chaos, he doesn't remind them of the wind and the waves. He reminds them of the anchor. And the book of Hebrews is a book about Jesus. It's about who he is, what he's capable of, that he is the supreme being in all of creation, that he is uh, fully sufficient in and of himself to give us peace uh, in, in times of trial. So they do focus on the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. And then one of my uh, favorite chapters in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 11. As the beginning of the book unpacks who Jesus is, what his claims are, that he is in fact the Son of God, that he is in fact God in flesh, the Messiah, the Savior, the King, then Hebrews 11 begins to, we call it the Hall of Faith, uh, because it unpacks a lot of Christians from the Old Testament that were faced with a lot of trials, and yet they stood firm and their anchor held through a lot of different types of storms. And you walk through Hebrews chapter 11 and the variety of challenges, both economic and political and uh, even uh, sickness and, and famine that they faced. And yet there were some, some heroes of the faith that the writer of Hebrews mentions in chapter 11. And he's holding them up basically, I think, as an example, like, hey, there's some people that have faced some horrible and some difficult and some challenging and some dark times. And yet they, 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 they put all their hope and all their faith in Jesus. And Jesus saw them through the storm and they're held up as an example for us so that we know how to live our lives and how to respond when storm hits our lives. So I love that chapter. I'd invite you uh, and maybe some extra free time you have uh, this week uh, to go read through Hebrews chapter 11 and look at that hall of faith and the heroes that have uh, weathered some storms. Um, but then after he unpacks Hebrews chapter 11, he unpacks all these people uh, that have walked through storms by faith. Uh, he reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, to fix our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. And he says, if you don't, then you're going to grow weary, you're going to lose heart, you're going to give up, you're going to give in to anxiety, you're going to give in to fear. So the, the, the admonition for us after the hall of faith in chapter 11 and verse 12 is to fix your eyes on Jesus. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, which is the verse I want to unfold for you here this morning. It's an unbelievable verse. It's an unbelievable promise. It's an incredible anchor for your soul. And Hebrews 12, 28 says this, Therefore, in light of everything he had unpacked in the first part of the book, in light of all the people in chapter 11 that lived faithful lives in difficult circumstances, in light of his admonition for us to fix our eyes on Jesus, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now what's unbelievable about this promise in this verse is that he doesn't suspend it and say, hey, after all your problems are resolved and after you get your job back and you get your toilet paper back and you get your economy back, you can believe this promise. It's written right into the middle of the chaos and the crisis and the storm that the first century Christians were surviving in. It's right, like right in the middle of their Monday morning. It says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken while everything else around them, their kingdom was being shaken. The writer says, you have to remember or you're not going to survive that you're a member and you're a citizen of a kingdom that cannot be shaken like everything else is shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And sometimes, and I think this is one of those seasons uh, where we really need to ask, again, some honest questions about where our hope is, where our identity is, where our peace is, and where our anchor is. Um, because honestly, I think in sometimes um, God either sends or allows situations like this and allows our whole world and our whole kingdom to be shaken so that we can realize that maybe we've put a little bit more of our hope in the economy rather than Jesus. Uh, maybe we have put a little bit more uh, hope in our health rather than in Jesus. Uh, maybe we have put a little bit more of our hope in our ability to, to provide and our ability to work than God taking care of us. Um, so in this season, we've got uh, some interesting questions to ask. Uh, and I believe sometimes God will use these to get your attention, to show you how shakable 
the, our, our kingdom actually is. And, you know, many of us maybe two weeks ago thought that things were just unshakable, and now we realize that that's not the case. And I honestly think that God sends these and allows these moments sometimes for us to be reminded of just that, that this kingdom is not a good place to put your ultimate hope. And so conversely, he invites us to be part of the kingdom of God, uh, where Jesus is king, where Jesus rules and Jesus reigns and peace rules and peace reigns. And so I want to unpack four things and, uh, from Hebrews chapter 12 for you that hopefully uh, meet you right where you're at. And again, maybe these are reminders for you, reminders of what is true. Maybe it's an invitation for you to take part in the kingdom. So number one, just looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, there is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that is important to know when everything else can be shaken. Uh, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, and that's been true since the beginning of man. There is no kingdom, even the Roman Empire, where people thought it could never fall. It fell. Um, the Babylonian Empire, it rose and it fell. Kingdoms rise and fall. Economies uh, ebb and flow. Uh, sickness comes and goes. Poverty comes in. Um, there is, you know, all the kingdoms that we know of in this earth can be shaken to their core. But there is a kingdom that exists where that's not the case. There is a kingdom where there is no sickness. There is a kingdom where there is no economic crisis. There's a kingdom where there's no fear. There's a kingdom where there's no poverty. There's a kingdom where all of the things that are shaken don't exist. It's sturdy. The king rules and reigns. Jesus has proven that he is able, that he is powerful enough to rule that kingdom as the king forever because he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead never to die again. He's defeated Satan. He's defeated sin. He's defeated death. He's defeated hell. He's defeated all our enemies to prove he can rule and reign over his kingdom on a throne forever and ever. There's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You need to know that because when everything is shaken around you, there needs to be a place for you to go uh, to find hope and to find peace and to put your anchor. That's what Hebrews 12 tells us. There is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And, you know, there's multiple verses, one in Philippians that I'm thinking of that invites us to, yes, be citizens and good citizens of the nation that we live in, to obey the laws and the rulers um, that we've been given. But ultimately, our, our citizenship is not here. We, we are citizens of a different world. Our primary identity needs to be found in the kingdom that cannot be shaken, because this is what will happen to you if you do that. Uh, if you put your ultimate hope in the kingdom of Jesus, you will not be shaken. Even if you lose a big portion of your portfolio, even if you get a sickness or you lose friends or family, uh, I'm not saying that those difficulties won't come. I am saying that if your hope is in the kingdom of Jesus, uh, you will not be shaken to your core. If your ultimate anchor is in the kingdom of Christ, uh, you won't be moved even when the storms come. If your identity is there, you can stand strong. Even Hebrews, after talking about the hope we have of the gospel, and being citizens of the kingdom, it says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. That if you put your hope, your identity in Christ the King and the kingdom of God, the anchor has been placed somewhere that when the storm comes, it will not crash your ship on the rocks and destroy your life. We've been invited to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Number two, this verse in verse 28. It's a present tense reality. Uh, I talk to people all the time, and one of the questions I get uh, after, after preaching or unpacking certain verses uh, have people that just seem to think that most of Christianity has to do with waiting for some promise that's going to take place in heaven, like just kind of surviving and, and waiting until you die, and you get to go to heaven, and you get to be in the kingdom, right? And there's a way in which the promise of the kingdom is, is the future, that there's a future reality that we will experience where we see Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, face to face. There, there's no more faith. Faith has shifted and turned into sight. There is no more death. There is no more tears. There, there, that all the old former things are gone. All the new has come. There will be a moment when the kingdom is fully realized and we are there physically with the king forever and ever. But there is also a way in which the kingdom of heaven is very present with us now. And this promise in, in verse 28 is a present tense. 
It doesn't say that you will be given a kingdom that can't be shaken. He says, be grateful for we are receiving. And that's a kind of a, a, a present tense that we have access to like pieces of, of heaven now. Uh, some theologians will call this the already not yet, uh, that the kingdom already exists, but it's also not yet. Uh, it has come and it is coming. And so both of those things are true for us that, uh, yes, there is a way in which we long for glory. We long for heaven. We long for all these things to be done away with and for us to be with Jesus forever. And that day is coming. But there is a way in which Jesus says to look around, and if you see some of these happen, the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. There's a way in which even in the midst of this chaos, since the kingdom is a present tense reality for us, the king reigns in your heart. Peace reigns in your heart. Life reigns in your heart. So the kingdom is coming, but uh, in this verse, it's a present tense reality. It's not something that you have to wait for. You don't have to wait for the gifts of the kingdom in storms like today because we've been given a kingdom that can't be shaken. Number three, this kingdom is received, it's not achieved. If you go back and look at the verse, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom. And this is really important, especially for those of you who would not call yourself Christians, uh, would not call yourself disciples or followers of Jesus. Uh, maybe you're moral. Maybe you try to do good things. Maybe you try to love other people. Uh, but you're curious about what it actually means to be a Christian. What it actually means is the Bible would say to be forgiven of your sin once and for all, uh, to be part of the kingdom, to have all of the benefits of the king. Uh, and the way that you get into the kingdom is not by achieving or trying to work hard or trying to do good things and avoid bad things. Verse 28 says, we have been, like we received something. You're, you're, you're only part of the kingdom if you receive, not if you achieve. You can't earn it. It must be given to you. And so this is, this is just the, the most basic invitation that I can give you is that you need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And the only way that you do that, according to Jesus Christ himself, is to receive something. That Jesus is a giver, he's a gift giver, and he loves to do things and gives things out of grace. And so that's what he has done uh, with salvation, is that he has done all the work, he has paid all the price, so that he offers to you a free gift of salvation that cannot be earned. It has to be received, and it's received by grace through faith. That means by grace that we don't earn it. Jesus is the one that earned it, that we don't work for it. Jesus is the one that worked for it. That It's not based on our good works. It's based on his good works. It's by grace. It's just a simple free gift that if you will come to, to Jesus in faith, that he will give you this kingdom. He will forgive your sin. He will place the Holy Spirit in your heart to be the comforter in difficult times. Uh, he will secure your place in the kingdom forever and ever. And that's what it means to be a Christian. And especially in seasons like this, where maybe there's turmoil going on in your life, it is, there is a huge chasm between trying to maybe act or function like a Christian and actually being a Christian. Because only one of those has actual deep-seated peace in your heart. So I want to invite you, if you have never received the gift of salvation from Jesus, to put your faith in him, to pray to him, to ask him to to forgive you, to change you, to save you, to make you part of the kingdom. The kingdom is received. It's not achieved. It's a gift that we receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. Number four, um, you see in the last part of this verse that the writer is trying to move us in the midst of chaos towards something via this truth, this truth of, yeah, you've been given this kingdom that can't be shaken. You've been changed by the grace of God that even in the midst of these things, he says, so let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So the security that we've been given of the kingdom, it should move us to worship the king. That's where this is all going. And that's, I think, what should stand out about Christians uh, in Midland, Texas, uh, or really anywhere for that matter, but especially in the, the chaos and the challenges that we're facing as a, a community, um, that uh, Christians should be able and should be excited to worship the King in the midst of all these things. 
um, that you find out throughout the pages of the Bible that people, when they were in difficult seasons, they didn't wait for the difficulties to pass to worship the king. They worshiped in the midst of it, and that's what Hebrews is inviting us to do. You don't have to wait until all of the problems disappear to bend your knee, to bow your heart, and to worship the king. We're invited to do that all throughout this process to be reminded that we've been a kingdom that we've been given a kingdom that can't be shaken. So there's no reason for us to fear. We need to worship. So I want to in, invite you to worship your way through this recession, uh, to worship your way through uh, your job questioning, to worship your way through this financial crisis, to worship your way through homeschooling your children, if that's the case, uh, to worship the King on your way through this difficult season. And sometimes. Sometimes we just simply equate worship with singing, uh, and that's not the case in the Bible. Uh, worship is a much bigger, broader, more robust response than simply singing. Singing is a part of it for sure. But in the Bible, worship is a, it's a response to, to God. That, you know, but basically, worship is an all-encompassing response to who we believe God is, what we believe Jesus has done, and what he has promised us. And since he's a king, and we have a kingdom that can't be shaken, we respond by worship. That means we give him our fears. That means we give him our praise. That means we sing. That means we give. That means we tell other people about Jesus. So I want to invite you to think through uh, how, how you can worship the king through this season, because that's what we're invited to do. And thus, let us offer to God or give up an offering to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And then the next verse says, for our God is a consuming fire. So I want you to be reminded of the security that we have in the kingdom through the gospel and let that move us towards worship. Uh, I wanted to end with a, a quick story here about one of my heroes of the faith. I've read a lot of his sermons and books from him and books about him. It's Jonathan Edwards. Uh, and so uh, I want, to, want you to see this picture of Jonathan. Everybody say, hi, John. Uh, he looks very excited to be here. And uh, he's honestly one of the one of the greatest men, most brilliant minds the United States has ever produced. Um, multiple accounts will agree to that. Uh, one of the most uh, influential Christians and pastors and preachers. Uh, he was a pastor up in Massachusetts in the mid 1700s, uh, and he really is credited to being one of the few that helped start the Great Awakening or a huge revival uh, in our country uh, that spread all the way from the U.S. across the Atlantic into many parts of. Uh, of England, uh, tens and tens of thousands of people were converted to Christ in a very short amount of time, and he was responsible in large part for that. Uh, he has some of the most famous and powerful sermons in history. Uh, he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, and I've I've been fascinated by Jonathan Edwards for a lot of reasons, and one of which was because he did not have an easy life. He had a lot of challenges, uh, and towards the end of his ministry at the church that he was pastoring, I had some family members die. Uh, there were some diseases that were breaking out. He had a lot of arguing in his church over communion, uh, if you could imagine that. Uh, a lot of problems in his church and his family and his life and his soul, and his church actually fired him. And this, it's... <laughs> It's unbelievable to think somebody fired Jonathan Edwards. If Jonathan Edwards was your pastor, you don't fire him. That's like letting go of Spurgeon and saying, we need to find a better pastor, better preacher, so firing Spurgeon. So they fired him. And in the midst of this really dark season of his life where from the outside, seemingly everything was going wrong and there was storms all around him, uh, somebody wrote this quote, as they, from the outside, were looking on to Jonathan Edwards and his heart and his life, and it seemed like he should be a complete mess. Because of what he was experiencing, Jonathan Edwards should have been an absolute dumpster fire and disaster because of the storms that his life was going through. And yet, this is what they said about him in that season. Somebody watched him walking through this, and they said, quote, his happiness was out of reach of his enemies that his happiness seemed to be completely out of reach of his circumstances and his enemies. And I think that's a good challenge for us um, because if, you're, if your anchor is somewhere other than the U.S. economy, 
uh, if your anchor is somewhere other than your health, or if your anchor is honestly somewhere other than this world, than this kingdom, if your anchor is in a different place, then you can't be shaken. <laughs> then, then you can walk through seasons like this and people should look at us and think, man, our happiness is that just out of reach of our enemies. Our happiness is out of reach of our circumstances. Our happiness is out of reach of the situations that we may find ourselves in. So um, wherever you find yourself today, I don't know if this is a good reminder uh, for you or an invitation to you. Um, but for those of you who belong to Jesus, I just want to remind you uh, that you have an anchor in a place that can't be moved, that you have been given a kingdom that can't be shaken, that Jesus is still good. He's still in control. He's still on his throne. He still knows you by name. He still knows your future, and he will still see you all the way home. I want to remind you of something that you already know so well. And then I also want to invite you to this if you find yourself just in a lot of turmoil, realizing that your ship is being tossed on the rocks, uh, that maybe for you, this is a good time to move your anchor. Uh, maybe this for you is a good time to put your hope once and for all in Jesus and his kingdom, to put your identity once and for all in who Jesus is and what he's done for you and what he says about you, and to move your anchor to trust in Christ. Uh, so that's the encouragement that I have for you from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 today. Uh, I hope it blesses your heart and I hope it moves you to worship Jesus. He's the only one worthy of the worship of all peoples and all places and all times. Let me pray for us and then we will uh, we'll be done for this morning. Lord Jesus, God, what, uh, what an incredible reality is that people uh, over video links and Zoom calls and all over this planet can uh, just reach out our voices and our hearts to you and that you hear us and that you understand the situations, that you're not unaware of what's taking place in our heart or in our city or in our country. And Lord, that we can simply pray to you. You hear us, you respond to us, and you answer prayers. So God, I pray just on behalf of of Redeemer and your people here, God, that you would give us a lot of peace that surpasses understanding, that you would help us to be uh, good worshipers in this season. God, I pray people in our city would look at us and be drawn into the security and the hope of the gospel because of the way that we trust you and we live our lives. God, help us to, to live with such hope that people ask where it's came, came from. And God, for those who might be part of this, uh, this service today, God, that don't have their hope in you, that don't have the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives. God, I pray that you might pull them in and draw them in uh, to be saved, to be forgiven, to be changed, to become Christians, and that they might receive that gift once and for all. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful in this time. God, we know that you have uh, put us here and that as Acts says that you have determined the time and the place and the location for all of us to live and so help us uh, to do well in the season that we have this baton of the gospel. Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you. We pray your presence with us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And uh, we hope that you'll join with us for some things coming up here in the future. Thanks for joining in for the sermon and the message today. We will see you soon. God bless. Thank you.